So what exactly are corals? This is a bit of audience participation. I want hands going up. Are they a plant? Are they an animal or are they a mineral? So everybody who thinks they're a plant, put your hand up. No one. Everybody who thinks they're an animal, put your hand up. Few. Everybody who thinks they're a mineral, put their hand up. Everybody who doesn't give a monkeys. You guys just don't care. Right? Well, they're, <laughs> they're all three, arguably. Uh, so obviously the mineral side of things is the calcium carbonate skeleton uh, that they lay down. The animal part is the polyp structure. Um, and then the plant part are these symbiotic algae, these zooxanthellae. Uh, so they don't really fit into any category. Uh, and that makes them pretty unique uh, and pretty special in my book um, and warrants further investigation. And that's what I've chosen to, to spend the rest of my life studying. So I've got to find them interesting at least some point. Um, if we look at uh, this kind of schematic, this little diagram, uh, what you see here is a, a cross-section uh, through the reef, looking into how detailed the calcium carbonate skeleton actually is. Uh, you can actually see quite a lot of them in the curio shops. We, we had a little wander around um, Mali uh, just before here, and we, we saw, unfortunately, uh, in, in our opinion, uh, quite a lot of uh, corals sitting around in the shops. Um, but hopefully you guys will also get out um, and have a look and a little snorkel around. Um, and that's where I'm from. At, we've just come at the moment is the Corallian Lab. Um, and we offer uh, summer courses. Um, and hopefully some of you guys will be interested enough to, to come and join us on those at some point. Um, but what you can see here is that actually the, the, the main part of the coral is this calcium carbonate skeleton. And it's only covered by this very thin layer of tissue. And if you look to my left here, uh, you can see a histological section of the corals, um, and you can see they're made of two main uh, tissue sections. You've got the endoderm and the ectoderm. Uh, the endoderm has the zooxanthellae, so uh, this is where the gastrovascular cavity is on the inside of the coral. You've got this thin acellular uh, mesoglia layer, um, uh, which doesn't have any uh, tissue inside it at all. Uh, and then you've got the ectoderm on the outside, which has your mucus glands, um, and your, your nematocysts. So the mucus glands are really important to understand uh, because they act as a first line of defense for corals. It's thought to be a, a major evolutionary step as far as animal development is called in the evolution of life, uh, where corals would be, were able to develop this mucus gland. Um, and it's used in two main ways. Um, you, you get uh, it, it being used for uh, capturing of food itself, so it can bring all the the mucus into its gut, uh, but it can also get rid of anything trying to settle on the coral surface. And we'll have a look at some videos uh, in the next few slides to show you how dynamic a layer uh, this mucus is. Um, so corals in general uh, are sessile. They're usually colonial. Um, their polyps secrete this uh, calcium carbonate skeleton. Um, and this matrix uh, forms this, uh, this skeleton of the coral colony. Uh, when they grow old, uh, new ones grow over the top, and it just carries on uh, in that way forever and a day until damage occurs. Um, what we also have is this whole, um, it, it was a term uh, coined uh, about 20 years ago, um, and it was called the holobiont. And it's a, a term where not only are you looking at the, the animal itself, uh, the symbiotic algae, the skeleton, uh, but you start to bring in microorganisms into the, this fact. So most organisms uh, have uh, an, an associated uh, microbiota or microfauna um, within a healthy system. And it's very important how the, the microorganisms affect corals in general. So here you've got uh, a couple more schematics. In this case, it shows the same sort of thing as we saw before, but it brings in uh, these little blue dots, uh, which are all uh, bacteria in this instance. Uh, but corals also have fungi and viruses, um, and these uh, different groups of microorganisms uh, are currently under-researched, uh, but people are starting to focus on uh, looking into this and seeing the roles they play in a healthy system, not just into a diseased state. I'm going to show you how microbes uh, affect corals in, as far as disease is concerned, uh, but I believe that interest is starting to shift in, in those good bacteria and how important they are for corals uh, as far as health is concerned. Um, so up at the top, you can see uh, a little schematic, again, about how the, the, the microbiota, in this case, fix carbon. Uh, they're important in, in uh, uh, nutrients, uh, nitrification. Um, 
gathering phosphorus and iron, um, and also as far as a, an antimicrobial defense. Um, it's a bit unclear whether the coral tissues themselves uh, have this antimicrobial power to fight off any uh, invasive pathogens, or whether it's simply just the, the associated bacteria. Um, but it, we seem to be getting a bit closer uh, as far as that's concerned. And then obviously you've got the zooxanthellae and the coral, the symbiosis, uh, which hopefully uh, you guys know a little bit about. So if we look at a coral, um, this is a, a, a hydra. But this is what we would be looking for um, as far as corals are concerned. We know there's a huge amount of bacteria associated with them. Uh, but one of the problems we've faced uh, with histology is we can't really find where these bacteria are. Never mind in a healthy system um, or a disease system. It's something which has evaded researchers uh, for many years. So if you look in a hydra, you can see all those blue dots and these ones in the lower ones. And they're stained with a different uh, immunohistology stain, uh, which stains your bacteria or oranges. Orange, oranges. Um, but you can see it lights up like a Christmas tree. So we can use these immunohistology uh, stains to, to target specific microorganisms, bacteria, fungi, uh, even protozoans, little ciliates, um, to see where they are within tissues of, of a wide variety of organisms. If you look at corals, um, the only things we can find uh, are these aggregations. This is the, the bacteria stain up as red in this instance. So as up at the top, you can actually see uh, these big uh, red aggregations. And that's something called endosychomonas, a genus of bacteria, uh, which is specific uh, for corals themselves. And you can find them in all different types of coral, um, and you find them in big clumps. But we also know there's a whole suite of different bacteria associated with the coral tissue, but they don't seem to be staining up uh, for some reason or other. And you'll see why this becomes a bit of a problem in a bit. Um, so corals are not defenseless organisms. They, they have quite a, um, a good arsenal behind them to, to fight off uh, different pathogens in the sea. Um, they have these specialized stinging cells called dinocytes, um, which all contain uh, these unique uh, organelles called nematocysts. Uh, if you ever touch a coral, uh, you are getting injected with thousands of bits of toxins. Um, it's just we don't feel it. Um, or at least most of us don't feel it. If you uh, suffer from anaphylactic shocks, then you might uh, get a bit of a, uh, a surprise. But in general, not many people feel them. Um, and they actually have three main types. They have penetrants, volvents, and, and glutenants. Uh, glutenants are a kind of sticky uh, nematocyst, so like a chameleon's tongue. It will come out and stick to the food, uh, whilst the penetrants and the nematocysts uh, have these high toxins, um, and they cause uh, the mass problems uh, for, the, for the fish um, and, or any other type of food which is coming by, a lot of uh, bacteria as well. Um, and depending on the size of the coral will depend on the prey item they actually eat. But most of them are uh, kind of eating uh, small plankton, um, zooplankton and, and phytoplankton. And then I've already mentioned that they have this protective mucus layer. This was actually taken uh, back in the late 80s um, and it was a, a random histological section through a, through a coral polyp, and they saw this big mucus plug. And the researchers who took this uh, just thought it was quite interesting, thought it, but it thought it was a unique uh, uh, occurrence, maybe something to do with the, the pres preservation method uh, they'd utilized, and they glossed over it for a while. Um, and then when we uh, started looking at it in a little bit more detail, uh, we showed that this, this mucus layer was really dynamic. Uh, and if you look at a coral uh, just under a microscope, it actually looks like a volcano. You can see the mucus just pouring out uh, of the polyps themselves. Um, in this instance, what we've done is we've used uh, activated carbon, which is a posh word for burnt toast, um, to put on uh, our coral polyps. It usually gets a laugh. You guys are a tough audience. Um, one laugh at the front, being very quiet. Laugh. No, nothing. Um, so what we do here is we can actually look at the, um, each individual polyp, each individual piece of carbon, and we can track the rate of the mucus flow. Um, and this depends on the health of the coral itself. So if the coral is in a stressed state, if it's bleached, uh, then they usually get a lot of mucus to start off with. But mucus is very energetically consuming uh, to produce. It's, it's very difficult for a coral to produce it. And they can only produce large amounts uh, when the coral is actually in a healthy state. 
So after the bleach state, after it's released a lot of mucus, it can't recharge anything, so it loses that line of defense, which is very important when pathogenic microbes start knocking. Um, so what we, what we start seeing then uh, is this uh, shift um, from a healthy state, as is the case in this slide, uh, to the bleached version. So when a coral's bleached, it's uh, something which has naturally been occurring for many years. Uh, these corals have uh, survived with this symbiosis um, and this uh, bleaching going on uh, since they developed in that case. But, uh, and, and if everything goes back to normal, if the environmental conditions return within a month, sometimes two months, uh, the corals can start to recover. And you can see this uh, recovery starting uh, to occur. But then they actually get hit by diseases. So the reason why this can be looked at as rather than recovery um, is because you can see sharp demarcation, uh, a nice straight line between the, the calcium carbonate skeleton and the coral tissues themselves. So this is a, a disease called uh, white syndrome or white plague in this instance. Um, and, and that's again uh, what I'll start looking at. So this is just a backdrop uh, to get you uh, a, a closer understanding of, of what happens in the corals and then we'll use a couple of case studies uh, to show you exactly uh, what species of bacteria and different microorganisms are, are responsible. <laughs> 